Evening all. Welcome to another King's Crusher radio show, Tuesdays. Uh, it's a bit later than usual, at 20 past 9 tonight. Uh, I thought we could carry on from last week to check out two absolutely classic games. So this is between 1920 and 1930, the best of the best, according to uh, Chess Games Comp. And actually, this game is, is pretty iconic to me. It's uh, Nimzovich against Capablanca, played in 1927. Now, Nimzovich did try and conceptualise the game with the classic book, My System. And uh, in My System, you know, a lot of it was about trying to reduce the opponent's counterplay to make sure they, they weren't really threatening anything and then you know, put yourself beyond defeat and then go for the opponent. Let's see what happened in this game. E4. And we'll take him a Planker's perspective. So Nimbovic, Nimbovic plays E4. We have Capablanca playing a Kara Khan. Yeah, which is which is a, a breath of fresh air. You know, you, normally you'd expect Capablanca to play E5. In fact, uh, we can ascertain how often did Capablanca play the Karakan. I'm just curious. I'm going to look it up and tell you. Uh, you can you can look this up at uh, chessgames.com. So e4. He played it 17 times apparently, compared to 126 for e5. And he also played the French defence on 16 occasions. So sitting on five, believe it or not. So he's played it the Karakan, Capablanca more than. Three times as much as apparently he played the Sicilian, which is a bit strange. Okay, you might think. So anyway, stats aside, uh, we have now d4 from the switch, d5. And nowadays, this variation does exist in a slightly different modified version. Uh, the advanced variation still is fairly popular because uh, British Grandmaster Nigel Shaw uh, started winning quite a few games with later a bishop e2 but in this game this looks like an early version of what's going on they didn't have as many stem games as us after bishop f5 uh, white often plays actually here according to Lieber knight f3 knight c3 h4 knight d2 bishop e3 but you'll notice a big avoidance c4 c3 knight e2 i'm going down the list a big avoidance g4 even bishop e2 here but there's a big avoidance of playing what was played in this game bishop d3 this might have been considered somehow to be an okay move at the time i'm pretty sure most of the games were early games where white used to play bishop d3 it's it's basically saying uh, really it's kind of a little bit anti-positional because White's advanced his pawns on dark squares and basically his light squares are already weak and it's basically inviting Black to exchange off the light square defender, defender. so it's kind of illogical really because really that's delightful for Black This in the French defence that would have been the bad bishop but here it's a delight that it's actually exchanged off and weakening White on the light squares uh, that's totally an ideal scenario for black to just basically uh, equalize here I, I think technically this must be equalizing uh, just just to take yeah it's bordering black's got no no problem here uh, he's actually got uh, you know squares to play with later these, these three key light squares they're all they've all been significantly weakened um, so we have e6 with no problem bishop and in fact black can still even pursue a French defence style undermining of white's pawn structure with c5 later maybe knight c3 we have queen b6 which is a French defence style move yeah and now we get the French defence style undermining But uh, I think Nimzovic was keen on this conceptually uh, 
because apparently uh, there was another game against Duras from St. Sebastian 1912 uh, a few years before this with Queen A6 here uh, so anyway we have uh, D takes C5 but I'm saying Mimsovic might not have minded this conceptually because he did talk about in my system the concept of giving up the centre with literal occupation of pawns to kind of get pressure on the centre and control with pieces later so maybe he didn't mind giving up his pawn chain and he had no intention of maintaining it anyway with c3 so perhaps he, he just wanted peace play across the centre and in a way that's a kind of hypermodern thing to do to so say you don't literally have to occupy the centre with pawns you can try and get control of it but there's an undertone to this already set here that although that might be fine and very very good idea in many positions uh, black has got these great outpost squares with which are actually quite convenient to get to one is actually because of that semi open c file going to be quite painful later if a knight's ever reach either f5 or c4 here so giving up the sensor maybe is it's of some importance but it's not everything here to try and get control of it with pieces and let's see knight e7 already this beautiful outpost square is is available we see knight a4 so white wants to get that dark square bishop and now take control of the dark squares you might think this is fine and dandy but this next move really does seem a bit strange by modern standards Limbs of which playing f4 it's such a beautiful blockade square mind you he does want to just support the pawn how else to support the pawn it's it's not easy to support that pawn if he plays bishop d4 actually we can put pressure on e5 anyway probably prompting f4 in any case because this starts to get tricky in the night f5 so yeah f4 is committed to and this is really by modern standards a pretty delicious position to have with black fully equalized here and um, actually there are some notes available I think in their public domain by Romy King and he mentioned because um, they're actually on, on chess games com he, he says it's rather amusing to compare this with the game Vajda uh, the Vajda Nimzovich game so maybe we should try and check that out after so here it seems you know black has more than uh, equalized here you can see that the exchange of light square bishops hasn't really helped why in fact this bishop now is blocked in basically by its own pawn a bit uh, we have c3 knight c6 and this knight is really once black does something with his king you know you can see that knight being a subject of attention later uh, first we have now uh, g6 uh, you might think a move like h5 yeah th this is kind of logical to try and stop g4 as well that that's playable as well a slight downside maybe is it's kind of weakening these dark squares potentially but uh, it's difficult to see that's a long way off to try and exploit that and in fact you know maybe uh, this this could be fine for black but anyway so Kepler, for whatever reason he didn't commit to h5 he played g6 and maybe this is great what he did because white actually was tempted here to play g4 which does create a permanent weakness so yeah maybe the tactical side of Nunesvich he wants to like bust black open with the king still in the center it looks as though isn't this a bit casual the king's still in the center the rook's not connected isn't this a bit casual but uh, knight takes e3 is played and black is better here after h5 it doesn't matter that the rooks are not connected all the kings in the center if we try and bust black up here tactically with say f5 i think e5 just drops but maybe even stronger than that 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 might have a little bit of controversy to it probably stronger is to take here because then we get that g we get that g file possibility uh, and possibly black just castles here saying well this is this is loose anyway if we have this sort of position e5 is loose 
this looks interesting uh more interesting for black to gain that center pawn black's going to be better white's king's a bit weak on that g file so it's all pretty interesting anyway uh on f5 i think it's all in black's favor black might even just c consider i think taking but it looks a little bit risky with the king in the center to do this maybe there is there is some compensation here with knight d4 now this is just equal there's compensation here so that other line is better basically of just taking and then casting queenside if black castle the queenside immediately uh i think there's an undermining point here yeah which is unpleasant a bit and again white would be maybe okay so okay uh we have though um yeah we have though instead of g5 i mean f f5 in a practical sense is probably the best try here this is yet another kind of really strange anti-positional looking move from capablanca basically saying to black you know there's this massive f5 square uh and unless you know this knight has some weird idea of i don't know how that knight would ever get to f6 in fact it's impossible I can't even visual, can't even see it uh, e, if it can't get to e4 or g4 there's no way a knight's coming into f6 so this seems entirely anti-positional this g5 uh, black castles and his king's pretty safe there it's probably safe from, than on the queen side so we see knight d4 for the moment though yeah it's contested with that knight so it's not that immediate to get a knight in there and in fact that threat may be stronger than the execution black's keeping that kind of positional threat alive and does he even need to use it he goes over here actually to accelerate this light square these are like related key light squares to aim for here of course we've got to be on the lookout tactically a move like f5 might be dangerous in practical terms um here though knight c4 and it's like with tempo hitting the queen and then i think black can afford this there's no smash here i think well apparently there's no smash here black should be able to consolidate this position without getting uh chat mated remember there's a kind of pinning going on here anyway so let's trust that f5 is not working uh so we have rookie two now this kind of prophylaxis anyway rook e8 is kind of it looks as though rook e8 mysterious rook move is saying on f5 i think black's just gonna like just take care with the rook ready so it's kind of it looks like a, a strange mysterious rook move prophylaxis maybe against f5 king g2 now knight c6 rook e d2 rook e c8 and now knight e7 now actually the rook occupies c4 so this knight is cozy with this square and the rooks are making some progress king g7 here now a5 now knight f5 getting rid of this central knight is a good thing to do and in fact black can afford uh not weakening d5 we can't afford weakening d5 here because i don't think that would be um what whilst rook takes d5 is not possible i think this is much better for black but the thing is um it's unnecessary to do this it's looks as though d5 is weak here. there's a tactical move here g takes yeah because this qu queen can't take there because then this kind of is too much rook h8 queen f3 rook h4 and you can see that the rooks are are on this f pawn and if say here i think we can just take that and blacks better here this this queen scenario is very good for black he's gonna have past pawn there that's very good 
So this is tactically uh, justified to take with the G pawn. Yeah, because of this continuation, rook h4, rook, rook h8, rook h4. Uh, yeah, so even though the queen's going to f3, rook h4 there. Um, just, just to once more check that out, you might think, oh, what about rook d4? What about it? We can either just take, that's just better for black. Throw in a check. And it's horrible. There's even a threat of mate there. Well, you know, white's just really passive. This is easy for black to win this position. Uh, so uh, let's go back. So queen f3, not taking on h5. And the king actually protects h5. Cute. We see it here now. Capablanca playing moves which infiltrate rook e4, rook c4, queen b5, rook c takes d4. Now, if rook takes d4 here, this is really good, rook e2. Because here, there's check. And if king h3, there's queen takes b2, this is just horrible. Yeah, so you get the picture there. That's just a really horrible line uh, here. So, yeah, rook takes h2. Yeah, this is the really horrible position for, for white. So he doesn't really want to um, take with the rook. This this forcing move here is too much to bear because the queen's basically crashing down the seventh rank after. So we have c takes. Queen c4, this is making inroads on those light squares. Look at all of, in fact, almost all of black's pieces are on light squares, that bit like a drafts game. Look at this, it's like, it's like a game of drafts, this position. And you can see the adjacent pawns on dark squares here. It, it is a bit of like game close to drafts, visually. Uh, so king g2, another pawn on the light square, but now b4, and this is squeezing white on the queen side. Queen c1, and white is actually being run out of moves, which is why this has been referred to quite often as the immortal Zugzwang game. White's been run out of moves here, and this is the sort of thing Nimzovich did to opponents, so that's why some commentators I've said that it's as though Capablanca's used Nimzich as my system against him. Uh, we see Queen h1. And the, the threat here is things like Rook e1. Uh, maybe to g1, maybe. Rook d3, Rook e1. Uh, but in fact, even stronger than Rook g1 is, is probably something like Rook f1, actually. Uh, because Queen g2, there's always h4. And if king hit, you know, we've got rook f3. Uh, just to show if white doesn't parry that. White did try and parry that, uh, rook f1, with rook f3, which controls f1. But let's say he didn't, just to show the importance of rook f3. Nimzovich's tactical awareness here. If he played this, rook f1. Let's say queen g2. Actually, we just have rook g1, pitting the queen. That's the end of that. And uh, if here, check this position, rook g2 is crashing. Yeah, the king's not in a great spot. OK, so rook, rook f3, trying to cling on for a bit. Rook d1 uh, with no immediate threat, but it's approaching Zugzwang. Now it's after b3 here, rook c1, and this is kind of Zugzwang now. Uh, White well, hasn't got any useful move. And plays actually. Yeah. Plays actually rook e3, which creates that weakness of the last move. Zog to end out of him the weakness of the last move to play rook f1 here. And here actually, uh, Nimzovich with the white pieces resigned 
Uh, let's just check this position. As mentioned, Queen G2, there's Rook G1. And if the Queen flees over here, Queen G1 check hits the Rook. Actually, winning the Rook. In fact, it's as simple as that. Here, uh, there's also a mate on G4. But it, winning the Rook is good enough. So, yeah, the Immortal Zugzwang game. Um, well, an Immortal Zugzwang game. Uh, well, it was coins like that, the other immortal Zugzwang. So Nimzovich was getting famous for doing this to his opponents, but it was done to him by Kampalanka. So that that was the final position, I think. Um, ah, rookie three, rook f1. Yeah, with the comment, one one might suppose this is from Ryan King that this game Kampalanka had carefully read my system. And then used all the theories contained therein against the inventor. <laughs> um, now, just 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 for a bit of uh, trivia, right? Let's compare it as recommended to this other game. If I can find it, there was a game Vajda against Nimzovich. Now, if I can find it, we'll quickly compare the situation. Uh, as far as the opening is concerned, mm, if I can find it, mm -hmm. mm. yeah, it's it's actually interesting, yeah. I'm, I'm just checking. There's a bit of a grueling rook and pawn in me, but Nimzovich with black got the same sort of uh, strategy. Uh, he got to play the same sort of strategy in 1927. So uh, let's quickly, quickly show you the gist of this. Just, just from a positional perspective. So Arpad Vajda was against Nimzovich in the Kashkomet Hungary tournament 1927. So this was 11th of July. I'll tell you if that's later or earlier. So they've both been played in 1927. So this is later in the year actually. The game I've just showed you apparently is was played in February, February 19th. So later in July, Nimzovich with the black pieces actually seems to imitate Capablanca's light square strategy with the Nimzovich opening. Just to give you the gist of this game. You see that white weakens f5 here and black wants to exchange off these bishops fundamentally which is an idea Petrosian used in a lot of his French defence games. So this, in fact Petrosian even used queen d7 because you want to stop this sometimes this trick with check winning the knight in variations of the French defence. You play queen d7 first, then bishop a6. But the idea here is similar. You see that f5 and c4 are weak. This is kind of sister game. You can see that f5 has been marked, c5 has been marked, c4 has been marked. And black's uh, building up an impressive, doesn't mind the exchange of queens. You see that positionally, this light square blockade strategy, that f5 has been nicely marked and sealed, sealing squares here, and the end game uh, just favours black here, which is on this occasion it's Nimzovich. So later in the year, in July, Nimzovich is uh, maybe having fond memories of his losses against Kafflenko, not so fond, but at least imitating. So knight takes wins that. We have a advantageous, slightly advantageous uh, rook and pawn ending, where white's pawns are slightly vulnerable. And it's barely, according to engines it's barely anything else but equal though. It's Here might be a slip up. Yeah it's a bit of a slog this game. But eventually Nimzovich slogged his way to get this position where he was winning. Yeah white really helped a bit. So rookie, rookie A and um, this is now winning for black, yeah. But you could. But the reason I want to show you is the pattern, really. It's the the light square strategy pattern is evident in both games. 
<clears throat> and I, I believe this is the game that was referred to uh, unless unless it was actually another one which coincidentally had uh, a, a light square strategy but I doubt it I, I believe that must be the game Vajda did play Nimzovich a year earlier uh, I don't think that's got anything to do with a light square strategy nope nothing just checking it oh, nothing okay so that, that was the relevant sister game I think brother game sister game okay uh, now let's go on to another amazing game from the best of the best so um Capablanca again this is two years later in 1929 so actually a lot of these games in the 20s are dominated uh, it seems mostly by Nimzovich and Capablanca these entries uh, Nimzovich, we saw Simon Nimzovich 1923, Nimzovich Capablanca 1927. There's another one later actually, but anyway, Capablanca against Treble, uh, 1929. So have a look at this. Uh, Capablanca playing white, d4, d5. We have a Slav, Bishop g5. Bishop takes might be two and actually funny enough talking about light and dark square strategies it it should be intuitively uh, clear already that black is weak on the dark squares and what he's done is actually allowed his guardian of the dark squares to just be exchanged off and he seems to be completely oblivious to this idea that he's got loads of dark square holes so we've got another game of chess and drafts here because we've got all these dark square weaknesses and uh, Capablanca can surely torture these dark square weaknesses. Let's see. Queen C2, G6, another one. Just put all the pawns on light squares, see what happens. Uh, I guess he was concerned about something there, but... Um, yep one knight on a dark square and now it's just supported here and it's supported there and now b4 and uh, rook fc1 queen f2 knight takes knight takes yeah this is a bit of a dominating position c5 a4 it looks as though b5 could be handy to try and create some targets on the queen side h3 depriving the knight of g4 no fun in games g4 is emphasizing a mega uh, dark square grip on both sides of the board now you can see that if that pawn ends up there all of the dark squares are being poked into actually uh, rook c2 the rooks are pretty versatile one advantage white enjoys with his space advantage is the flexibility of the rooks you can see that white's rooks can easily switch from one side of the board to another. In Michael Steen, he does talk about that as one of the big advantages of having a space advantage is actually the quality of your rooks can sometimes just switch from one side to the other rapidly. If you look at Black's rooks, because of this passive pawn structure, there's no the, the in, there's interruptions basically across the pawn structure. You see, technically, there's just loads of interruptions. Whilst here we've got a second rank completely clear, so we can either switch. For say g takes or we can switch for say b5 to white's rooks because of that second rank clear and the extra space advantage has got much more versatility in the rooks here uh, and you might want to use like the g for the g2 for doubling or both either, either doubling here or doubling here is, is both attractive for either g5 g takes or b5 respectively so king h8 rook g2 such versatile rooks compared to blacks uh, so but actually white uh, does actually this is quite an interesting decision because you might think you might be cautious here to close the king side so what would you play here would you be cautious to close to not close the king side to maybe consider traveling for something like g takes what would you do here interesting I I'm not sure engines still now understand closed positions, but it does seem to agree uh, 
with Capablanca's move. Let me just ask, what would you play here? White play. What would you play here? What what did, what did you think is played in this position? <clears throat> you see, I've just mentioned you might be tempted with you know doubling or trebling and then G takes, or you might not. You might have some other idea in mind. So, what what do you reckon is is played here? Any ideas? 50 points, if you can guess it. Okay. Um, it actually was closing. That king side is just closed off. It's just closed off. Yeah. I, I think the problem is, you know, is the hassle factor. It comes down to a hassle factor, I believe. Um, because even though I could advertise to you this idea of trebling, uh, you know what? Black, whenever he takes, he's just bearing down on e3. There's a big hassle there. But if we play g5, you know, there's actually another break in the position which has far less hassle, which is namely preparing this way if we can prepare this way there's far less hassle like that because there's nothing opening up for black white has fundamentally got that backwards um e pawn if this opens up that's a backward e pawn on a simian file on, on yeah simian file so we see queen d8 this is far less hassle and white might actually just be building up for h5 now King g7 he does actually play h5 not worrying about black trying to grab and keep the pawn there's no way black is going to take this pawn he doesn't because it's just going to immediately drop off here we could try king g6 but then you know white's just going to double here and uh this is just isolated this stuff is isolated uh which, which might be something on the radio actually about uh, there, there was something on BBC London radio just earlier in the day about uh, gangs they pick on isolated areas it just made you think of isolated pawns in chess for some reason so I thought I'd mention it now so this is this is like isolated areas that can be picked on in the form of isolated pawns they're just, they're just going there's no way of defending them the pawns are, if they're not defending each other they're going to drop off here they're dropping off here once this drops off then we've got this measly pawn and then you know frontal pressure on that is going to be horrible so there's no point black taking off here. He's just isolating his pawns. So we see rook h8, rook h2, and white can at leisure just put the pressure on. Now, he's, remember, he's also got eight, knight h4 potentially as well. Queen c7, queen c3, king f2. He can at leisure double behind this. And remember, there's also knight h4 potentially. So here, black's clinging on, it seems, against this idea of white opening up the position. Uh, is there any point to this? Queen a1, queen a3. Well, the thing is, Capablanca is creating <laughs> a large V sign for victory in this game. <laughs> he's creating, he's, he's got a sense of humour here, he's trying to create a large V sign. You can imagine if this pawn's here, look, we've got a large V being spelt out. <laughs> There's a V sign being spelt out here. On So, does that have any practical value, this uh, V sign? <laughs> okay, A takes and actually, the king side, instead of opening up he continues that V sign, so we've got a, quite a large stretch of V here emerging <laughs> after A takes. We've almost got a gigantic whopping great V sign here, which uh, visually is interesting and technically it's holding a lot of dark squares and the rooks are passive compared to white's rooks. 
does black dare take here by the same token of reasoning this would isolate pawns and you would think once we win that then that one's dropping off because they're pretty isolated but in fact immediately there's a tactic here in this particular position with c6 check just winning the bishop so that's not even possible so queen d6 we just take the queen and then c takes so we've got this gigantic v sign being constructed and in fact it is completed b6 v for victory why does is is this favorable or has white just closed up the position too much too much to create some sort of fortress is this a fortress position it's a strange thing aesthetically should white be better well he has got access to one entry point which is a7 and he focuses on that rook a1 queen b4 rook a7 is used bit of pressure on b7 which means tactically this move might be handy at some point the rook's coming in to support the other rook rook a4 alakine's gun Alakine honoured by Capablanca with Alakine's gun. King g3, King h4. I, I don't know. Uh, Capablanca was maybe having a hot date or something with some, some women at the time of this game and was in a good mood for creating something artistic, maybe. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what. I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, yeah. Okay, I don't know. But it, it that there. there White controls this position, or maybe it's because he didn't have a hot date that evening, so he thought he'd decide to be a total masochist in this game to poor Tre Treble. You know, total masochism. Just wants to say, I'm dominating the position here. You're doing nothing. I haven't got a tennis date after this game. I've got all the time in the world to talk to you. So, Queen A1. <laughs> um, King G8. Okay. So black's doing nothing, right? It's clear that black cannot challenge the A file because of this Alakine's gun. King G3, King F8, King G2. The point of the target point is B7 here. That's the one pawn that is under pressure. So what does white do? He finds a plan to torture that pawn a bit more. Knight D2. This has got the idea that we can do this to torture that pawn. And this bishop, poor bishop, cannot really help this guy. It hasn't got c6, has it? Or has it? can these rapidly shuffle so bishop c8 happens? Yes, amusingly, the rooks shuffle along, sliding block puzzle. Or, hang on, it's too late for that, but there is knight d8. Just in time, there's knight d8. But alas, there is something, a rude awakening about this. There's a crushing blow played in this position. White play, crushing, crushing blow. I'll give you 200 points if you can see what white plays. So this culminates the you know, that V that's been created. How do you celebrate a gigantic whopping great V structure in the position? <clears throat> White play. Oh, I've just realised, sorry, I should give credit. There's someone called Joel's Rule Capablanca in the chat here who should know what he played. This is one of Capablanca's classic games. <laughs> Jose Roll Capablanca. Jose. I'll get the pronunciation, sorry. Okay, let, let me pronounce Capablanca. Stop butchering it. They've got a pronunciation on chessgames.com. Except they haven't for him. Oh great. Okay. Oh well. 
Anyway, yeah, bishop a6. Wow, bishop a6. It was taken, allowing rook takes d7 here. The game continued like that. And if it wasn't taken, if it wasn't taken, then knight takes b7. Knight takes. Rook takes. And the queen is not looking too well. In fact, white's winning a piece there. So there's not really too much uh, choice there. Yeah, because there's like three things on b7 and only two protecting it. So white's now created this past pawn. And is threatening rook takes h7, among other things. We have rook e7 trying to stop that. But now, uh, a cute little tactic. Rook takes, forcing move, knight takes. And here, black resigns. Because if he moves the queen somewhere to keep hold of the rook, White can take either rook here with a big advantage. If he, let's say, knight takes and rook takes, we're just crashing through with these two passed pawns now. So that's the end of that game, basically. Example, you know, crash through, check. Uh, that's just desperate. This is just desperate to open up some for some counter play. Uh, but it's all running with check. There's no time for any naughty business. And we can just take the queens off here with queen a7. So there's no time for queen g4. That's just uh, for sake of the illustration. So yeah, it's uh, it ended after this, um, you know, rook takes d8, crashing through, breaking blacks. Basically, stru structure was broken here totally. So th those two connected past pawns. Okay, uh, so that was a classic game of some sort with that strange V formation set up. So I hope you got a kick out of that one. Uh, yeah, there's there's a few pages of kibitzing at Chess Games Con for that game. Uh, v for Victory is, funny enough, the nickname of the game. So you, you saw that gigantic v, v formation being created, which creates a certain aesthetic uniqueness on this game. But it also echoes something, you know, Magnus Colson said, I don't believe in fortresses. There was an Achilles hill to black seemingly fortressy position at B7, which was just tactically broken down. Okay. Hope you got something from these two games. And uh, remember to thumbs up the video if you got if you liked it, this stream. And uh, see you next week. Have a good week. Thanks very much. Cheers then. Oh, uh, one fun ten boring quick poll here. While your thumbing's up, if you want to quickly uh, fill a poll. <clears throat> so if this was the cinema credits start and no one stays around except if it's a Marvel film because there might be something at the end some secret gem at the end of a Marvel film at the cinema which you'd miss if you went just because of the credits running but yeah the credits are basically in effect running now and uh, there's no secret bit at the end <laughs> uh, I'm afraid uh, next week we do have uh, another Nims of game as well as a Reti game mm. alright that's all I can say okay Thanks very much.